Rise of Banning for IFL TV in association with MTK Global. I'm delighted to have with me today, very happy, Tony Sims. Tony, how are we doing? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. You? I'm not too bad, not too bad. How's the uh, bubble been this week for you? I know you've been here a couple of times before. Yeah, I've been here, I reckon I've done loads of these. Probably done more than anybody, but um, yeah, it's just like one of them things, COVID, uh, you know, COVID caused a lot of restrictions and it's something that um, basically we've got to do. So, um, but you know, it's, it's not easy when you're um, having to stay in the bubble and, and you know, your head's still in the gym. Obviously, I've got my brother uh, running the gym for me while I'm not here, but um, obviously I'd rather be in the gym than be in this bubble. But you know, it's got to be done for my fighter to fight on Saturday night, Joe Caldina, then I've got to come in a bubble with him, so there's no way out of it, but hopefully um, this will all like, come to an end soon, doing a bubble. I had my vaccine on uh, Monday, just because I was saying to Eddie, yeah, I don't really need to do this, you know what I mean? But um, So yeah, so I had my vaccine on Monday, and then my second vaccine's at the end of May, so hopefully by then, we won't have to do these bubbles anymore, because normally what you would do is, you would, uh, they would go on the fight, would do the press conference without me. Then, um, and then on the Friday, I would just go to the weigh-in after training the fighters, go to the weigh-in, do the weigh-in, and maybe go back to the gym and do the rest of the work. Whereas here, yeah, I'm coming here for a press conference, which I don't normally do, you know, and then I'm obviously here for the weigh-in today. And then, you know, the fight's tomorrow. So really, you sort of, I'm, I'm not really doing much for the two days I'm in here. I've been walking around and eating, so um, you know, it's a, to me, like it's a waste of time. But it's it's something that you, you've just got to do, otherwise your fighter can't fight Saturday. So. But just going back to that Josh Kelly fight, were you were you surprised in the manner of defeat? Um, I thought Josh Kelly, skill wise, he's a great fighter, and I thought he had the beating of Addison in ability wise. But I've never believed Josh Kelly is a welterweight. I don't believe that a man that size trying to make welterweight, he, you know, you watch his fights, his distance fights, and you always see in the second half of the fight, you see him fading. And, you know, if you're taking, uh, if you're trying to make a weight that you can't make and you're, and, you know, you're straining to make that weight, it'll always show up in the long distance fights. And I believe, like, if the fight was made at an heavier weight, he probably would have had the beating of him. But you can just see these last few fights, you can just see him fading. Once, once you get half the fight out of the way, he just fades. You know, he's got no work rate. And, um, you know, with Avenician, he's, he's a proper machine, Avenician. You know, we've seen him time and time again. He punches hard. You know, he puts the pressure on you, don't leave you alone. And if you watch the first three rounds, Kelly was in complete control. But then you just see the, the pressure of Avenisa and start getting to Kelly and he just couldn't hold it. You know, he couldn't hold that pace that he was going at. And um, yeah, it was a shame really because we were sort of, I was speaking to Eddie Earn, we was lining up the Conor Ben Josh Kelly fight for like December time. Obviously, they they'd have both had a fight in the interim and it was lining up to be a big British domestic fight. You know, because as their personalities are polar opposites to each other as well, you know, the way they are. So, you know, and that's what you need. You need domestic opponents with, you know, opposite personalities to make fights, you know, and uh, a bit like Fury and Joshua, really. Do you know what I mean? That's what makes fights. And, um, yeah, it was a shame, really. But I think Josh Kelly can come back if he moves up a weight, you know, or even maybe two weights. I think he can uh, he can come back. He's he's a, he's ability second to none. You know he's a very very good fighter, and um, you know you know he's a game fighter as well. Because when you watched him in the Olympics, you know you see how game he was when he when when he boxed in the Olympics. So he can come back, but he needs to be at his right weight. You've got a very busy schedule coming up. Uh, we've got Felix Cash uh, and Bentley obviously announced that's going to take place on on BT. A lot of people thought that Felix wasn't going to take this fight. Obviously went to purse bids, Eddie lost the purse bids. It's going to happen on BT, but you wanted this fight, you wanted Felix to have this fight with, with Bentley. 
Well, Felix wanted to fight. He, he, he did have, uh, you know, when, when Matchroom lost the purse bid to uh, Frank Warren, you know, Eddie did offer him an alternative fight against Signani for the European title, which Eddie could have put on easily. But Felix wanted to do the Denzel Bentley fight. He, he wants to win a Lonsdale belt. He feels that he was the number one fighter behind uh, Liam Williams, who was British champion. And he should have really been in the final eliminator, really. Do you know what I mean? Um, but listen, Denzel and Denzel, Denzel got himself into the final eliminator and he grabbed the title with both fans, so fair play to him. But, you know, Den, uh, Felix was always the number one above, uh, above Denzel Bentley. So, you know, he feels like that, that's, his, that's his destiny to win a British title. He wants to win it. So he, he said, I'd rather fight for the British and then go for the European after on that route. So rather than go European and then come back to British. So uh, that's what he wanted to do. So, you know, if the fighter wants to do that and he's happy to do that, then, you know, uh, you know that's what we're going to do. That's a great fight. We look forward to it. Uh, Ted Cheeseman, James Melkaff, obviously not far away as well now. How's Ted looking in the gym? Ted's good, you know. He was ready for March the 6th. Um, I had to pull him back for a few days and give him a few days off restart him up again but um, he's in great shape he's, he's ready to go as always and um, you know uh, as we see last year he was in like fight of the year with Sam Egerton and uh, you know that's the way Ted fights you know he brings the heat and you know whoever's going to fight Ted knows they're going to be in an hard fight and he had a bit of an unlucky year the year before where I thought he was unlucky not to get decisions that I felt that he should have done but you know he's pulled it back round and He's got the chance to win the British again, and JJ Metcalf's a, a very good opponent. He's like 21 and 0, the son of Shane Neary, and you know he's he's a very good fighter. You know, in, in a couple of fights I've seen of him, you know, he brings the heat as well. So I think at some stage in that fight, you're going to see a bit of a war. You know, as, as Ted likes that anyway, and um, I, I think it's going to going to be a very good fight. Looking forward to the yacht next week. Yeah, it's different, isn't it? It's yeah, different yeah. going on the yacht, and uh, yeah, it'd be different. But I've heard the weather's nice as well out there. So you you probably enjoy this bubble next week. Yeah, yeah, I probably probably will. It makes a change, doesn't it? But um, yeah, no, it'd be different. And uh, Matchroom always seem to find a way to put on a spectacular show. We see that with the fight camps last summer. I, I don't think anyone envisioned um, the shows to be like that in the fight camp. I mean, I certainly didn't, you know, and I've been in that office like a million times, but I couldn't envision how they was going to do that bit. Like, it, it was spectacular, wasn't it, the way they'd done it, you know, and it, when you looked it on TV, it's fantastic. And I'm sure the the, uh, the Gibraltar show is going to be uh, great as well. They always do, they do everything in a big way, like an American way, everything's big. So, you know, I'm sure it's going to be a spectacular night. Martin J. Ward, uh, what's the latest with him? Yeah, I've just been sport speaking to Eddie Earn just now, so the, he's got the IBF final eliminator, which obviously he's been waiting for, against the Zinga Fuseli um, from South Africa. So what, what's happening now is obviously because of the South African COVID, uh, um, what they've got over there, the variant they've got over there, they're a bit more in a dangerous stage than anywhere else in the world. So you know, there's a little bit of a problem with South Africans leaving the country at the moment, but Eddie just said to me, he's trying to line the fight up for May the 15th um, in London, uh, depending on whether, whether Fuseli can obviously come out of the country, hopefully by then he can. So I think that's what we're probably looking at, May the 15th, for the final eliminator for Martin. And, um, you know, he's been waiting a long time for this, uh, for this fight and... Uh, you know, he's finally there now in the final eliminate. He's like one step away from the world title. And, uh, you know, I need him to go out and, you know, win this fight and, you know, m make a name for himself and get into that world title mix. John Ryder, uh, Eddie's been talking about trying to get him a final eliminator or an eliminator of some sort. David Lemieux's been mentioned in the past as well. Um, so, as any update with regards to when well, he'll be back in the yeah, ring? No, he, he's... he's um, 
He's been ordered by the WBA to fight um, David Morrell for the WBA regular uh, title. Now, the title was made vacant by Canelo and Morrell was the interim champion. Um, for some odd reason, uh, the WBA have handed him the title through the post, which makes negotiations a little bit much more harder for John, because obviously the challenger receives a lot less money than the champion, and instead of being a 50-50 split for a vacant title, now, now we're doing a much different split. So I think Eddie's trying to work that out with PBC, uh, the money financial side of it, because obviously if John's got to go to America, fight for the WBA regular, then obviously you want a decent purse for that. You know, you're going out of your own comforts into a you know a different country. Basically, you're fighting in their backyard on their show, so you want paying. But with the split, I don't know whether it's going to be enough money to go over there. I'm not going to just take silly money to go over there and fight an hard fight like that. So we're sort of at a stage where Eddie's trying to negotiate at the minute PBC on the financial side of it, but that's what John's um, that's what John's uh, next fight could be for the WBA regular. So something from Craig Richards yesterday to say that he has now signed his part of the contract uh, for Bivol. Um, can you confirm that that is done now and that's the next fight? Well, obviously my brother Peter looks after Craig. He, he trains in my gym. And my brother Peter trains and manages him and um, I think they're pretty close to uh, doing the Bivol fight now and um, I think he'll probably get announced pretty soon, you know what I mean? So I think like Craig's done his end of things. I think they were just waiting for Bivol to sort of do his end of things. But listen, it's a massive opportunity for Craig. Like when it was first mentioned, uh, Peter rung me and said, what do you think? I said, listen, you get offered a world title fight, don't matter against who, you've got to take it. It's this your opportunity in life. You know, it's, uh, it's an hard fight. Bivol's a talented fighter talented amateur, world champion. Listen, Craig Richards can punch, he's developed and he's improved a lot, you know, in the last couple of years. And he, you know, he's not without a chance in this fight, you know. And sometimes you get these opportunities, like look at Valdez uh, last week against Burchell. Uh, you couldn't tell me one person fancied Valdez to win that fight. When you, wa when you watch Miguel Birch Burchell, he's like, the guy's a machine, you know. He, um, you watch him and you think, oh, I don't want to put my fighter in with him, do you know what I mean? He's like, he's non-stop punching and he can bang, he's just like, his work rate's phenomenal, but look at what Valdez done to him, no one see that coming. So you can never write anybody off in world title fights because people rise to the occasion, you know, and the fighters that rise to the occasion are the fighters that can come out victorious, you know, and if, you're, if the fighter's up for it and he believes in himself, does all his preparations right, you know, and then there's always an opportunity to win. And, um, you know, Craig's been around my gym for a few years and I've watched him um, improve, improve, you know, and uh, come on. And you, you see him against Shaq and Peters last time. Everyone had Shaq and Peters as a favourite, you know, and, and Craig knocked him out. So, you know, you can never count him out of, out of the fight. OK. Um, Tony, before I let you go, uh, a fighter that you manage, you know very well, Anthony Joshua, looks like Tyson Fury could be next. I don't really want to talk about the political side on whether the fight's going to happen or not. It's going to happen one day, whether it's in the summer or late this year. How much has Anthony Joshua improved and also how much has Tyson improved and how difficult is this fight for both fighters? Yeah, um, uh, you know, the fight's, I think the fight's near, near enough done from, from what I'm hearing, but um, I don't know whether they've signed contracts, but everyone knows in the country the fight's going to happen. Um, it's a fantastic fight, you know, it's like not just on the British scene but on the world scene. I mean, everyone wants to see that fight, unified heavyweight championship of the world. I mean, we ain't seen that for, for many a years, you know, and to have two British fighters uh, contesting for that. I, I know both fighters, I've worked both their corners, so I know them like well, you know, and obviously I was with Anthony Joshua for three or four years working with him. So I know him very well and um, they'll both believe they can win the fight. I think it's a 50-50 fight. Um, if you look at Tyson Fury, you know, where he was a couple of years ago, 
you know, the adversity that he's come through, you know, to go and knock Wilder out in the fashion that he did, you know, it's phenomenal. So, you know, he's he, he's a great fighter and um, he's a gifted fighter, very gifted. He's a natural fighter. Mentally, he gets into other fighters' heads as well. He's, he's got that way about him that he can get inside the other person's head. And, um, and then you've got Joshua, who, I, as I say, I know very well. He, Joshua is a machine. He's a machine in the gym. He trains crazy the way he trains, you know. And um, he's a great athlete. He can punch. He can box. You know, he's near on the same size as Fury, uh, height-wise. So, you know, it's going to be an absolute spectac spectacle of a fight. And, you know, this, you're hearing now that they're going to do a two-fight deal as well. So, you know, what an occasion that's going to be for the world to tune into that as a boxing fan. You know, you've got to say every boxing fan in the world is going to want to watch that fight. And I think the build-up is going to be phenomenal, the build-up to it. You know, it's going to be great. When you say it's going to be 50-50, what, what do you think it's going to come down to once in the ring? It'll just come down, what it'll end up, there's very fine lines when you're getting two, you know, fighters like that at the top of their game. They're both in their prime. And with heavyweight boxing, it's going to come down to, it could come down to one punch. But it's going to come down to obviously preparation, who's right on the night, and whether that style of fighting, because it's hard to prepare for either one of them in sparring. So it's going to come down to when you get in there, you know, is your knowledge and ring generalship and everything that you've done in your career to get to that one point, is that going to overcome that sort of opponent? You know, and it's hard, it's hard, it's a hard one to read. You know, it'd be interesting to even watch the first round. I think everyone's going to be glued just to the first round to watch what tactics they're both going to bring because with Fury, he's so versatile. that We see in the first Wilder fight, that he jabbed the move for the whole fight. And in the second Wilder fight, and he did tell everybody what he was going to do, he just walked through him and knocked him out. And he did tell everyone he was going to do that as well. So, you know, and Joshua showed a bit of versatility in the, in the second Ruiz fight that we ain't really seen. He was on the move, using the jab, you know, using, i.e., like Muhammad Ali tactics on the back foot that we ain't really seen before. Because normally with Joshua, you just see him walk people down and bang them out. So, you know, they're both, they both got, you know, a good boxing brain. They both got, they both carry power, and they, you know, they, they'll both be in great shape. I'm certain of that. And it will just come down to fine lines who's going to win. You know, we could see a 12-round war, i.e., like an Ali Frazier sort of fight, or you could see a big knockout on the cards. You don't know for either one of them. Are you going to pick a winner? Um. I'll struggle to pick a winner out of them both. Do you know what I mean? I would struggle. Um, one's, you know, you're, as the build up to the to the fight, you get nearer to the fight, you start leaning to one, towards one fighter, and then something else will make you lean towards the other. And that's what makes this fight such a great fight, is because the reason everybody wants to tune in is because no one really knows who's going to win the fight. You know, you couldn't, you wouldn't put your ass on either one of them. So you couldn't really say who's going to win the fight, and that's what makes it such a brilliant fight.